Hi there, and welcome to The Works. I'm Ben Shea. And I'm Ben Peltier. In tonight's show, it isn't often that a classical music CD sells more copies than some of the most popular pop music CDs, but that's what happened with the soundtrack of the movie Tout le Matin du Monde in 1991. The musical director and performer on much of that music CD was the early music master Jordi Saval. He was in Hong Kong recently, and we talked to him later in the show. We also take a look at the exhibition Trailblazers, an exhibition of some of the latest art from Europe and the United States put together by two curators from Bristol, England, Chippy Coates and Richard Scarry. First, though, this week we look at one of the most successful and most controversial artists of our time, Damien Hirst. <music> You've got to give people more than they bring to the table. You've got people have got to walk away from any artwork with more than they w walked up to up to it with. So I think you've got to you know it's got to be generous in some way. But you know you can you know you can disturb and you know you can disturb somebody but give them something something back. So it's, you know for me it's more always been really about the nature of art and the way that that can happen. Damien Hirst is one of the most controversial artists of our times. He's certainly one of the most financially successful. His net worth has been estimated as around 300 million US dollars. His works are revered by some, ridiculed by others. Many say his critics aren't even created by his own hand. So what does make him important? I think he deals with the big subjects which resonate across the board with any sentient human being. What is the meaning of, of, of life? What, what is it that we're on earth for? And what about the inevitability of death? How do we confront that? I mean, he said it from the, from very early age, he had a terror of death. And that is something that is conveyed in his art, sometimes in very um, aggressive or powerful or visceral ways, sometimes in very thoughtful or poetic ways. In February, White Cube opened the exhibition Entomology Cabinets and Paintings, Scalpel Blade Paintings and Colour Charts at its Hong Kong gallery. It will run until the 4th of May and includes some of Hearst's most recent series of works. There are, there's the Entomological Cabinets and Paintings, so there are the, the, the cabinets and um, onto canvas of, of bugs, insects, spiders, butterflies and so on, which have all sorts of resonance in both his work and in, and in Western art too. Then there are the scalpel paintings, and then there are the colour chart paintings. The colour chart paintings um, are, are quite interesting because they are, they're found colour charts. The colour charts are part of one strand of Hearst's work, a more abstract and formal strand. Like the dot paintings, they don't represent anything in particular. These and the works that focus more clearly on ideas of life and death could almost be the works of two different artists. They seem worlds apart, but there are connections. At a first glance, many of the scalpel paintings in the exhibition, for instance, are just highly symmetrical abstract patterns. Many look Middle Eastern or Islamic. Other scalpel paintings return to the subject matter of bugs. Later, even with the scalpels, he began to use colour and move away from the more symmetrical images. But it's when you look closer and focus on the scalpel blades themselves that another layer of meaning appears. On one level, pattern. On the other, an instrument of science or dissection an instrument that can make the difference between life and death. The scalpels relate to, to the medicine cabinets. They're a medical implement. Damien has often been accused, and I think he would plead guilty to a certain extent, of wanting to get under people's skin, metaphorically. Literally, the way you get under people's skin is with scalpels. And also, there's, there's been this cliché, I think, it's become a cliché in the last 10, 15 years, about cutting-edge art. I think the scalpel paintings are cutting-edge art on every level, and I think, I think Damien Hirst is playing with that idea. The third strand of Hirst's work in the current exhibition are images composed of insects. 
Some are paintings, where the insects are stuck on canvas or into paint. Others are cabinets that remind you of museum displays. These relate to other cabinets he's created, where items are placed in tidy and structured patterns. In these cabinet works, images of medicine or mortality, of life and death, have a symmetry and order similar to that of the spot paintings. It's interesting because all these works have a, a there's a symmetry, sometimes a symmetry subverted, but pretty well uh, uh, across the board a symmetry. And there's also this idea of mirroring. That, that for example, there's a butterfly cabinet where quite literally you see yourself looking at these beautifully ordered rows of butterflies and bugs. And actually, in a lot of his work, like one of his great artistic heroes, Francis Bacon, there is a reflection that you always see when you look at a glass Damien Hirst painting or cabinet, where you see a trace or an image of yourself. The insect paintings work in a different way than the cabinets. Looking at them from a distance, they're huge, highly coloured, abstract patterns. Looked at closer, they're images of astonishingly vivid colour and of death. There's a long history of the memento mori, or reminder of our mortality in Western art. Often it's in the form of skulls or skeletons, sometimes in portraits of famous individuals. In so much of his work, Hurst gives us the strongest reminder of death he can. If you use actual dead creatures that once were alive in your art, by definition, you're, you're bringing the viewer closer to the idea of actual death than you are if you either photograph them or, twice removed, you actually paint them. As with all his work, Hurst's insect and butterfly works have been controversial. Insects do die to make them. Hurst buys his butterflies and insects from entomological suppliers. Every single one requires certification to prove it's not part of an endangered species. The use of insects, though, isn't just there as a stark reminder of death. Sometimes they have a vivid colour that could be captured no other way. Actually, you only have to look at a painting like that. That is months' worth of intricate work. The, the plotting of the symmetry of the fold, everything mirrors everything else. It's a, it's, a, it's a hugely elaborate process. These are literally nature paintings, not just oil or watercolour paintings of the natural world, but paintings that incorporate and use nature. You can see them just as pattern or just as novelties, or they can encourage you to stop and think. Microcosmically, these things work. But macrocosmically, you need to stand in front of them to understand exactly quite what they are. There's an, you know that old-fashioned idea of the sublime, where when you stand, in, uh, stand confronting a, a, a natural phenomenon or a, a beautiful landscape or a storm or whatever, you realise one's insignificance in the grand scheme of things, where human beings really are in the grand scheme of things and how susceptible we are to the forces and powers of nature. Hearst says that the Hong Kong exhibition may mark the end of one stage of his career and the beginning of another. Tim Marlowe says that one reason he couldn't be here for the exhibition opening is that he's currently in his studio working on a new series, perhaps a return to more traditional paintings. But whatever the new works are, don't expect Damien Hearst to give up on the idea of being provocative. Something very comforting in the real world can become a terrifying work of art. So it's like, you know, like a, like a colour chart. It's very, very comforting there's a colour chart. You go, oh yeah, that means everything that I know can be logically understood, which is something very comforting. Whereas once you make that into a great big painting, people go, is that all you do? What is that all there is? And it becomes a terrifying work of art because you're like, why is that art? You know, it's like, where's the... Because what's comforting in a work of art is, some, is a faithful representation of the real world. So once you take an object from the real world and make it, you know, you go, why? You know, the big question of why, it horrifies people, you know, it upsets people if you go, why would you do that? We'll be back after the break. See you then. Welcome back. 
Curators and art exhibitors Chippy Coates and Richard Scarry, based in Bristol, England, have been blogging about art and artists who inspire them since 2009. Within a couple of years, the fan base for the blog grew, so they started to sell and show artworks. 